Good morning, everybody. Today is Tuesday, February 13th, 2018. This is MMA Junkie Radio's pre-show, the show before the show. I just realized, how who did this yesterday? Was it George? Yeah, I think yeah, it was. It was, wasn't it, Danny? Yes. He's yes, Dan. He's Danny. That's who they, they is. Yay. <laughs> what was that? Was that Bob's Burgers? <laughs> two minutes, two minutes. Yeah, Danny, what no the hell is that? that? I sound like the girl from Bob's it Burgers. No, it Tina? sound it does it does sound like Tina, but I always think that it was uh, Ricky Bones saying it and recording it. I don't know though. It's it's, it's just, just on the board. always been there. It's uh-huh. always been there. It's one of those things that no. as soon as I found it, I kept it. What, Danny? As you get older, I bet my Wookie. You're gonna realize that one of the <laughs> most annoying things as an older guy is having to bend over and pick something up <laughs> when you drop it. <laughs> We've been talking it's a lot about bending over lately. It sucks. Uh, you gotta think of your old man voice. And do, uh. You know that's usually my barometer for like if I'm having like discomfort bending over or tying a shoe. That's always been my discomfort. Like okay, I'm getting near two bills for me. That's what that usually means for Dan Tom. You're near two bills. I've dropped weight with this whole you know not drinking and limited uh, limited limited the fast food and. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, uh, with with just this whole surgery, even though it's it hasn't helped the sedentary lifestyle, it, uh, yeah, I think I'm uh, I think I was like 189 with like five pounds of clothes on before the surgery, mm. and then they didn't cut anything out. They added some mesh. I don't think it weighed That's too much. It's a lot much, of clothes, but, you know. You shouldn't wear clothes that are that heavy. Five pounds of, of clothes. <laughs> Coming up at 30. Well, you know, I don't think about it. My like wallet, shoes, my wo- hoodie. Clothes? How, you know, how how I wanna, you when I get home, I want to weigh five pounds. Weigh your clothes. clothes? And see how much yeah. that would be. <laughs> All right, guys, we are coming up in fifteen. Every day, one percent. <laughs> oh, I don't know, somewhere around there. All right, guys, coming up. I'll get you an answer. Being that shy. Oh my god. Stand by. How about that? We are making our descent into Las Vegas McCarran Airport. On behalf of our crew, we'd like to thank you for flying MMA Junkie Airlines. Now please fasten your seatbelts and put your tray tables in your upright position because the descent is going to be a little bit bumpy. <laughs> All right, Junkie Nation, it's time to roll, baby, on MMA Junkie Radio with gorgeous George and Go. This is what we do and why we do it, baby. All night long. We rollin'! Yes! The MMA Junkie Radio Revolution is upon us. Can you dig it? There's no escape. No escape. Through the vast frontier of cyberspace. And through a sea of stars in outer space. One small step for man. One giant leap for mankind. We've solidified our combat communication stranglehold. We are controlling transmission. With the use of MMA Junkie Radio and Sirius XM satellite radio technology. MMA Junkie Radio. Commence transmission. Live from MMA Junkie Radio HQ in the fight capital of the world. Las Vegas, Nevada. Here are your hosts, Gorgeous George and Goes. From the fight capital of the world, inside the beautiful Mandalay Bay Racing Sportsbook, you are listening to the MMA Junkie Radio Show. We're the only show that matters. I'm your host, Gorgeous George. With me, as always, is the devious and dastardly Goes. Our ace co-host, to my left, the fight analyst, Dan Tom and back east, handling all the producing duties, Danny Otto. What's up, guys? What up, everybody? Not Not much. Morning. Not much. Feeling better, Dan? Uh, like I was saying, I think every day 1%, every day 1%, you know, the, the the wound's healing good, just... What are you at, though? What percent? Five? Were you serious? Uh, I don't know. You I can't be five. I, posted, uh, I said that. Well, I, I, posted oh. th- I posted this update on Twitter. I was now able to lower my level enough to uh, open the dryer by myself, which was, uh, which was a feat. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Shit. Because I mean, well, how are you using the bat? I'm like, well, there's a little bit of a difference because there's lowering yourself, which thankfully, even though I'm pretty sedentary, I, I, one of the few workouts I will do at home because it's so easy to bust out while I, while I study tapes, I'll do uh, air squats and I'll just crank out like a hundred of those in, in blocks, you know, mm-hmm. just to keep those muscles from making. And it's coming in handy now, right, to lower myself. But 
you're not allowed to engage your your, your stomach mu- uh, muscles just like with jo- George Senior had. Mm-hmm. And so when you're not just you know pulling, you're kind of engaging your stomach muscles. But if you are lowering your level and then pulling, you are engaging your stomach muscles more to compensate for your balance and lower level. So all these little mechanics that you would never think about. Um, like you even engage your stomach muscles going down the stairs. So like I keep catching myself going down stairs too fast and uh, and whatnot. So just these little things like that. So it was just it sounded like a really random post, but it was like a small victory today, you know. Okay. So what percentage you at? Uh, I would say I got to imagine I'm probably still in, in in the D in the D range. I would give myself a 67 percent. Um, you know I'm able to drive. Yesterday was my first day of driving. It was a success. So that's mm-hmm. good. Um, but I mean, you know, I'm not getting the staples out till next Tuesday, which will be two weeks from the surgery date. And, um, and yeah, it's still, yeah, yeah. It's, it looks like a gross, essentially a big, gross, uh, unhappy face, um, that they, that they, mo- which I was telling goes like, it wasn't supposed to be like that. I think the one that you guys are explaining, the, m- the more common one that, you know, I, I, I don't want to speak for George senior, but I know my stepdad had a lathroscopic, I believe is the word type of surgery in the belly button, how they usually address it. But like I said, mine was a bit complicated. Mm-hmm. So, of course, right before I go into surgery, he goes, yeah, we're going to go from here to here. And he makes this big line. And I go, that, that wasn't what you told me in the pre So He's like, yeah, well, you know, explaining you know, the complications and whatnot to be safe. And we're going to go ho- ahead and lay out the whole area. And uh, it was it was pretty horrific. I don't know if your surgery went like this, but, you know, essentially, you know, I'm sitting there and he was it was like I was like Scrooge, the, the three ghosts of Christmas past. You know, they're like, OK, you're going to get visited by your nurse, your anesthesiologist and your doctor. And they were all very nice. But at the end, the doctor gave me that news. Fast forward, I'm already plugged in with the IV, right? So that's already in me. I'm just kind of waiting. It's like you're waiting two hours. I don't know if you have to wait for a while for your surgery. And that's the worst part, which is fine. But now they're wheeling me back. And I don't know if anyone, you know, any Junkie Nation had this with their surgeries. Or George, you, yours, you can weigh in here in a second. But they wheel me back, and all of a sudden I see surgery ward. You know, no regular clothes beyond this point. I'm like, oh, wow, it's getting real, right? And I'm like, hey, they're going to put me out any time now, right? Like, I'm not going to. I'm not going to have to see the instruments because old Dan Tom always watches the worst movies before any possible thing. Final Destination before I get on a plane. Uh, you know, Eternal Sunshine. How would you do that? Well, it was just, you know, bad. Eternal Sunshine is a sign of a spotless mind after I have a breakup. You name it. Watch a movie where a girl's getting, like, cut open. You didn't watch Hostel or anything, did you? N- no, it was, it was a movie on Netflix, and essentially, like, the, the character's explaining why she, was, why she was a certain way, and it flashes back to when she was a kid, and it goes to the surgery scene where she's laying in a similar bed that I was. And she makes the mistake of looking in and she sees all the sharp knives and instruments. And it was the same thing where they wheel me in. And before I even get to my room, it's like four quadrants of a room separated by a big room in the surgery ward, right? And in the quadrant rooms of surgery, you can see with open doors what's going on. And one of them looked like a very large hairy man with his foot, feet, and stirrups and was cut open from, you know, the, the, the genital, you know, kind of area. And I've heard in my eyes... And the guys were just, you know, you see like the nurses, anesthesiologists hanging out in front of him like he's a d- the damn water cooler. And I'm like, okay, I didn't need to see that before I go in. You know, you're hearing, you know, some, you know, another surgeon blasting metal some from some far away. It feels like the scene from Walking Dead. I don't know if it's season five or something. A spoiler alert. Dude, I'm falling apart here. So yeah. this is really happening? Yeah, this is or happening. Or I, I'm not even, this. no, no, this is all happening. So I, as I you're walking, you really saw that? I'm getting wheeled in, yeah. Oh, like okay. they're thinking, what in. was the movie? No, 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 no. It, looks, it feels like a movie, though. And, and I, I'm, I'm seeing the surgery. I'm hearing, like... Heavy metal feels like the scene from freaking Walking Dead where they're like getting woken up to like the, the torture room, and next thing you know, I'm in, uh, they wheel me into my surgery room where I was not like that at all. Okay, see, it was it was, it was I was the last guy though, and it was pretty quiet. Like, okay, you're freaking me out. Like thinking, geez, I mean, yeah, no, it was it was it was, it was real, and like you know the and of course I make the mistake, and they they weren't using that table, but there was a table afar in my operating room where there was sharp instruments and bloody rags and i'm like i didn't need to look at that and they interrupt me go hey can you scoot over because now it's sanitary they've wheeled me think so. this is desert springs this is also the oldest hospital in las vegas put it this way i had my uh, uh pre-surgery prep exam on a fold-out chair in the nurse's exam room was a fold-out chair so i will leave that for the imagination of what this room of the whores that i'm explaining look like oh and those were there oh, well maybe not i don't know I, thankfully i had a great surgeon who did a great job and you know <coughs> the nurses were telling me you know low-key like low-key if i take it a surgery i go to this guy so that was a plus right yeah but just it was such a traumatic experience because they had me go from the bed i don't know if they made you do it to the slab and they called it a slab because it was like a steel slab like you see in the movies where the more like the morgue is and, and I have to lay on there. there. It was cold. And they're like, hey, it's okay. It's okay. And they start strapping me down. Like, hey, give me your arm. Like a movie. And then, boom, all of a sudden, there's another perpendicular smaller steel slab, which they strap my arm to with a big 
black thick leather strap and they're like it's okay and in my head i'm trying not to panic right and i'm like oh i get it just like when you're getting tattooed or working on a piece of art you need a splay you need tension on your surface they're just trying to splay me out before they slice me open it's a comforting thought then after this point we're gonna start uh, anesthesia. Start putting. You're like, okay, yes, please, please put me under at this point. Yeah. Like you're gonna feel b- burning. Well, at least you got that warning. The guy and told me, "How'd this happen?" Oh man, I was at this bed. Oh, he. The next he thing, I'm woken up. Here's some coke. Oh, I want that. Here's some chips, and I was like, "What? It's over. It's over. You did well. You know. Oh wow. And and uh, wow. But but then they were also trying to get rid of me because I was the last guy, and it went uh. two hours longer than it was supposed to. See, see, I, 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 I woke. You, you up seemed like a, you had a nightmare experience. It, you know what? I woke up great though, because I woke up like uh, the end of Ghostbusters, like Dan Aykroyd. You know when he gets slimed after he's possessed, he's like, "I love you, man." Like I was like the happy. I was apparently I was cracking jokes when I got out. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. So you're sixty-seven percent. Yeah, sixty-seven percent. You improve about a percent a day. Why did you have that pillow here yesterday? Anytime Just I have to a cushion laugh in case you laughed. Yeah, laugh, cough, any kind of hiccup, any kind of. Like things you just again you don't think about the mechanics of. Um, I essentially they just told me to post a pillow uh, over my stomach where the staples are. To uh, I'm stitched up very well by the way. Nothing's gonna happen, but essentially just to hold my guts in to make sure everything that they sewed in stays into place. And they they sew it pretty well. Like there's like a massive amount of internal stitches apparently they do. And the mesh they put on my abdominal wall, I imagine that has to last for life. So I I, I imagine they're not using you know silly putty to put it on. So hopefully everything stays because I. I definitely uh, don't want to have to go through that soon. They're like, oh, wow, you're really young for this to be going through this. I'm like, ah. damn, let's get it over with. This fool got jacked up, didn't he? Yeah, I, I, I would have rather had, had a surgery. I think, so. a, I think yours is worse than, I mean, yours sounds worse than mine, but at least you can walk and drive within a week. Yeah, yeah, recovery so wise. I'm not about to say something as outrageous. I, th- I think I'd rather have, you know, not nothing like that, but yours sounds your experience sounds worse than mine. Hmm. I, 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 and, uh, y- again, you, uh, you, I would rather have your like, Cosby experience though, where like I keep saying Cosby, huh? but like you know, a guy like <laughs> cunning you, like kind of yeah, tricks you. Cosby tri- was not present. Like, <laughs> like not that, but like, you know, a guy kind of tricks you to sleep. Because I would have preferred, even if the guy that was Bill Cosby himself, I would have preferred to be tricked to sleep than have to like have gone through that messed up, messed up Mr. Toad's yeah, wild ride on my on my way to the surgery. Bloody rags! Wow, <laughs> that's that's horrific. Look, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, today we're gonna talk to CB Dalloway. He's gonna be on the show. Right, right smack in the middle. It's a two-hour show. We just started, so in about 55 minutes, we'll talk to him. He's got Hector Lombard here in Vegas, UFC 222. A couple middleweights that uh, both could really use that win over each other. Their names, they are actual names, and, and I think you know, getting each guy getting past the other would be uh, a nice comeback you know, uh, so that they can uh, just continue their climb to where they once were. Uh, Lombard was a... You know, top five guy at one point, um, especially when he was over at Bellator, Wreck and Shop, comes over, had a couple wins, then he explored the welterweight division a little bit, and now he's back to middleweight. C.B. Dalloway came with uh, a lot of pop, you know, being an All-American in college and through the reality show, he was tapped as the favorite. And then coming out of that, uh, I just, I think a lot of people felt like, well, he came up short in the reality show. Watch and see what he does now. And, you know, but he came through the Anderson Silva era, man. Nobody looked good then. So now that he's kind of been out of the way for a few years, uh, a few other guys have had their their, their turn. Weidman, Rockhold, uh, you know, um, Bisping, and here we are. Well, we'll see. We'll see if one of these guys can get a, get a win and start uh, getting involved with some of those bigger names like Branch and Brunson and Rockhold and Weidman and Whitaker and whoever else. But first, it all starts on March 3rd. So – uh, aside from that, we will talk a little bit of uh, Junkie Gathering. We'll take some calls, talk about the latest news in the sport of mixed martial arts, and, you know, maybe put to bed finally UFC 221, which took place this past weekend with Yul Romero knocking out Luke Rockhold in the main event, Curtis Blades taking out Mark Hunt in the uh, co-main event. We went over the bonuses and attendance and all that, but this will give you all a chance to uh, give final thoughts. And, of course, we want to get Goza's thoughts on those two big fights, uh, as well as the other stuff that you know has been happening. So uh, you you weren't here yesterday, but uh, you want to talk a little bit about the, those two fights in Australia? Yeah, the uh, the main event I thought was a fun fight. I thought Rockhold won round one. I thought round two went to Romero, and I thought Rockhold was winning round three up until the KO. The only thing that really surprised me on Rockhold's behalf is I really thought that calf kick was working at round one. I thought he had him very hurt. Hurt badly, 
And in round two, he kind of so much that it. he thought he was his leg was broken. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, th- I thought he just completely abandoned it from there on. I think uh, towards uh, the beginning of round three, I think he, he went to it a little bit more. But I think it, had he just kept going to it, he, Yoel Romero would have been in a real bad spot. But that's Monday morning quarterback stuff, right? And I mean, the poor guy, Luke Rockhold, put so much into every camp. It sucks that he just hasn't been able to get the results that he's wanted as of late. And I really cannot point to very many things that, that he's doing wrong. It's just sometimes you get caught, and with a guy like Yola Romero, it seems like a lot of people that are on the other side of him have that story to tell. So I guess now we get to see the rematch. And I'm pretty excited for it because it was a fun fight the first time around. Once your button's been pushed, and I'm talking about the chin, mm-hmm. a lot of fighters can either get over it and maybe go another eight years before another knockout or – they can become more susceptible to big punches. And the thing is, we don't know. We don't know if that's exactly what it is because it could be that Bisping was pinpoint, spinning back kick, uh, Vitor Belfort was pinpoint, and Yo Romero, you know, was pinpoint. We don't know. Um, I think they were. Well, I know Vitor's was for sure. Yeah. All right. There's a lot and of And the unfortunate thing shots. is that night, Rockhold paid him a lot of respect and he said, uh, steroids didn't give him that win. That was just a perfectly placed kick. Mm-hmm. But if you think about it, what we'll never know is, um, you know, with, when it comes to allegations is any fighter that may have had the, these types of enhancements to get through a camp or on that night, could that have been the advantage they needed to get past somebody yeah. else? We don't know. But that's why I, I always point to the statement. test, the testing before during and after and that's all we can go on that's the only literature we can go on and uh you know we tour just had an incredible 2013 but i know that rockhold and bisping have had a big problem with uh you know al- the al- any allegations that have been sent that guy's way or or any um uh hunches or or b- back locker room talk you know stories whatever mm-hmm. so regardless let's get past that um you know, Yoel's – Bisping was – you know, he he had, he had a nice combo on uh, the follow-up. It's the two follow-ups that have really, really sc- stort, uh, starched Luke, you know. Reminds so anyway, me a lot of Frank Trigg and Robbie Lawler. Yeah. Uh, last punch. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what I'm getting at is time off for sure would be a nice thing. Uh, and maybe moving up to 205. I don't know what – you know, how bad this weight cut depletes them or not. Uh, but you're right. You said something that was key, and that's – the fight was unfolding, I think, how Luke Rockhold would want, you know. The only thing that maybe wasn't happening that a lot of us expected, and maybe Luke, was that Yoel would have been a little bit more depleted. Expended because, more energy, right? Yeah, we've seen him in other fights start to tire a little bit sooner. But you got to give Yoel credit. I think he was managing his uh, his gas tank mm-hmm. you know, a little bit better and making sure he was efficient when he did strike and that he was recovering in between. That comes with experience, you know, uh, and, and learning from your mistakes. I so think Luke made some adjustments halfway through, too, because I, I think a lot of people saw what you were saying, and that's that he just wasn't expending the type of energy that you expect. So you could tell he was looking maybe towards a five-round fight, picking his shots a little bit more. But Luke was doing great, I thought, with the kick and with the jab to score just enough in the rounds to, to be on top but also not expend too much energy so that he could be ready for those later rounds. It just didn't play out his way that day. Now, you've seen a lot of footage. I want to ask you a question. These guys that are 6'3 to 6'8, you know, we talk about the advantage of them having length, yep. you know. But have you noticed that a lot of times that when it does become some sort of a firefight, if they don't, like, I wish they had quicker feet rather than longer strides, you know, yeah. whether they're retreating um I think what would help Luke in the future is when there is some sort of an attack, some sort of a pivot out. You know what I mean? Of course, keeping his hands up. But I've noticed him and other taller fighters as they're retreating, it's just a slow process. And, and that's why that chin can be out. And um, they, they, they can sometimes take a lot of damage. Alexander Gustafson. I remember that big dude, Matt Van Buren. I thought he was going to have a little bit more of a successful career because he had a, a longer, lanky frame as well. Stefan Struve. It's like when the assault comes their way, 
the the big steps backwards isn't a quick enough of a retreat, you know, mm -hmm. for the guys that are just covering so much ground, like like Yol Romero, like Tyron Woodley that can close, you know, all that distance so quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I would think bigger guys, when it comes to defense, just need to also work on their the – the quickness of their feet and their defense within, within the, um, within the phone booth, you know, area. Yeah, I mean, you 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 laid it out well as far as uh, even that even connects what you just said. It kind of connects to the follow up shots that we're seeing with a guy like Rockhold. You know, depending on how guys move and how their frames are, they move in different ways. So they're going to do a taking strides, like Gigi said. So when they're getting hit, oftentimes they're going to be you know teetering teetering over that follow up shot's going to need to happen. But as far as like the general question you just asked as far as the long frame and how that relates, I still would side with the long frame, whether you're talking about grappling, right? You can, or even counter wrestling, you can hit levers, reversals, you can hit chokes as far as jujitsu. You've got your reach as far as your jab, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to quote uh, a gentleman that was on your guys' last, uh, last, uh, last Virginia tour, Jens Pulver. When, uh, oh, give me credit if I get this right off the top of my head. I want to say UFC 32 when Din Thomas was facing BJ Penn. Jens Pulver was commentating, and he said something that always sticks in my head. He goes, "Those, the, it's great to have that reach, but when you're a long guy, you miss, you miss big." And it's, yeah. it's very simple, sure. but it, you you do that math, and that's kind of the strides that what you explained, Gigi, and that that's a much more simpler way to explain it. But that's always what, what's always wrong to me. You miss, you miss big, because just like everything in li life, there is no biological free lunch. Even if you're like Yoel Romero, if you can stuff the takedowns and take them in a round five, like Robert Whitaker, we've seen there is no biological free lunch. Even a guy that can pace himself as well as Yoel can, right? Yeah. So it, with with everything comes its own unique puzzle. But I, I like, yeah, yeah, you're, it, it's important to visit that one because you're right. You know, even at the high level, there's these interesting details you pointed out, Struve and some other guys you see with the long frame, the give and take. Yeah. Um, I You know, Luke was very comfortable when the spacing was there and he was able to throw, uh, you know, kicks to the body. Mm -hmm. Jab, his jab was nice. His one, two just covered a lot of ground. Right. And when he was in control, it was nice. And how about the time when they locked up and he kind of had a plum? You could just see there was – this comfort level of this is where I want to be or this is where I want to be. Right. Oh. But um, when Rock, excuse me, not Rock, when uh, Romero would explode, the defense, you know, there, there was some cover up. There was sticking the hand out. There was a retreat, but it was all happening kind of slow, not fast enough to keep up with Romero's blitz. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and I think that in that process, maybe some sort of, I mean, yeah, you said it Monday, Monday morning quarterback, mm -hmm. but some sort of a quick pivot right then and there. Uh, might be the better defense. At least that's what I've noticed I, I like some of the other fighters that are tall, except they're in the, the lower weight classes, so they still retain some of the, the quickness, you know, in yeah, their feet, like yeah, a shuffle, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, in the heavier divisions, it's more of a, like a, a thundering type step, you know, e yeah. each movement that goes uh, in any direction. It's, it's John Jones, actually, a couple times, that's how he's been hit. Yeah, no, 100%. It's easier, you know, you're, they say tall guy defense, your head's more up there to be hit by, by, by nature. But I like that you said pivot because maybe a pivot maybe could have helped him because ironically, you're right. The knees, the leg kicks, which surprised me. I figured UL Romero coming from American Top Team, you know, a camp that's been kicking to the legs, he would have done that. Rocco looked look great. His jab looked great. But his, his patented defense is check right hook. When guys come in, he does that check right hook. It, his best punch was actually the one that failed him, kind of akin to the Jens Pulver quote, when you miss, you miss big because he went with that check right hook, and that's what UL – Waited for that's why he threw the, the double jab to draw that to draw that shot out. And once that check right hook came, you see Yoel came over the top, and that essentially was the kill shot. And the kill shot is what we think the follow up is, but what started it was waiting for he that check hook. Caught him back here too, right? Didn't he? It caught him. It, it it caught him here, which 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 which, which, which you know can happen. But yeah. you said pivot, and it's kind of funny. And again, far be it from me, Jesus, he's got way better, way amazing coaches and whatnot. But it makes me think, though, a pivot could have helped because Nate Diaz was using that check hook a lot from the southpaw stance, but Nate will kind of pivot with it, and when he pivots, it kind of, you know, it, it, it limits. You take it a little bit on the shoulder. You're not giving a clean shot to the temple, and you're kind of limiting that target. So you're throwing offense as defense, but you're still protecting yourself, whereas Luke, he kind of throws his a bit straight up, or he'll lean his head, and he'll come back in, and you saw with Bisping, he came right back into that left hook. So interesting i'm just kind of thinking out loud as you mentioned that that was a good point yeah yeah pivot. i think early on uh yoel felt luke's power mm -hmm. and just was not i mean there was this look on his face where you could almost tell he said i took your best shot and it did not impress me mm -hmm. and i think that's how he was able to calculate when he was going to go in for the kill and not worry as where if you see when luke would strike he did a good job of, of striking and keeping balance because a lot of guys are so afraid of 
what Yoel can do. They're off balance a lot of times, and he was he was he had very good balance, but I think he was holding back a little bit, and Yoel wasn't. I wonder if the yeah. fight gets past the third round. You know, those sixty seconds that you sit on the stool and you cool down. What would have happened with that leg, or maybe another kick from uh, Luke Rockhold towards Romero's leg? Maybe he would have been able to slow him down. Uh, your quick thoughts on on um, hunting, uh, blades. hunting blades? Yeah. Well, I thought I thought Blades did a good job. I mean, he did exactly what he needed to do. There were moments that Hunt could have capitalized, and I mean, how many times do we say, "Hey, go for the finish, go for the kill"? Hunt was just a little bit too much in doing that, and and Curtis took advantage of it. But that that's what happens when you dedicate that much of your life to that sort of training you have that tool and some guys don't do that and he was able to hold them down and keep them down and he just kept doing it over and over and you saw how exhausted mark hunt was and I, i'm not going to say he wasn't in shape or anything like that like i think anybody in that situation would have been that tired but it's just a draining amount of strikes that he was hitting them with we've heard over and over what mark hunt kind of thinks of what's going on with these type of strikes that definitely did not help that case yeah, um, Hunt has incredible power, and one thing that's worked for him actually is the ability to hit someone and keep that spacing and allow the reaction of the fallen fighter mm -hmm. to almost call to the end of the fight. Because when you get hit by Mark Hunt, you're not just going to fall and go, whoa, I'm ready for your ground and pound. You're actually going to fall like, what the fuck, like a truck just hit you, and your body's just going to flop, you know? And a lot of times, Hunt hesitates. And that alone almost sells it. And the referee looks and goes, wow, that guy's fucked up. And he waves it. And I felt like there was two times when Hunt hit him that had he hit him and been in there quicker, you know, and maybe just a quick steal of the jaw in the ground and pound position it may have ended it uh, or up against the cage. Just, you know, keep throwing because obviously when Hunt is hitting you, damage is occurring. Um, but far be it for me to, to say, you know, what, what a professional kickboxing champion should do. I mean, yeah. that's just what it looked like to me is that, you know, he's a big guy, so maybe it's obviously you're not going to see some guy hit and then spring on him. But uh, I've always noticed a little bit of a hesitation that has worked in his favor and sometimes not. And maybe that's what that split second that allowed for Blades to recover. But Blades, I love that he put his ego in check. Whatever skills he learned from, uh, you know, the guys in Colorado in regards to boxing and kickboxing, he said, all right. We'll get back to that in my next camp or my subsequent camps. Right now, I'm a wrestler. I need to wrestle because mm -hmm. this guy's on the verge of sleeping me, you know. And uh, that's what he did for the next two rounds, especially in round three. There was no fuck around stage. There wasn't like, well, I got to wait for my opening. He yeah, got to no, him quickly, yeah. you know, and said, boom, down. And then after that, he, you know, I think that really, really stole Mark Hunt's soul. Yeah. I, overall, I thought that the card was great. And I tweeted this, but what really stood out for me, what made the fight fun was the commentary. And I thought Jimmy Smith was incredible, but I think the guy that gets forgotten about is John Anik mm -hmm. because he's gotten so good at his job, but think about how difficult it is to have to switch your partner up every yeah. time. He said this was his 16th uh, partner. Isn't that incredible? Who I'm are they? I mean, And they had instant chemistry. There was It was from the moment they started. It just seemed like that if you tuned in and you'd never watched Mixed Martial Arts, you'd think these guys... We're, we're basically the, the Madden and Summerall, right? You're just like, oh, they must have been doing this for years. No? Cut their First teeth time. in Bellator, both guys, too, ironically Incredible. enough. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Season one on that's uh, right. yep. ESPN, right, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when it was... Uh, what was it ESPN? Bell was yeah, they, I forget the... Uh, Deportes? The Ocho? Yeah. The Ocho. Uh, all right, I'll tell you what. You know what will be interesting? Throughout the show, let's see if we can come up with all 16 of his partners. Can't cheat. I don't want anybody to look. Let's just see how, how we can do it. Some of them will be easy. Some will be slam dunks. And right now, let's take this break. You're listening to MMA Junkie Radio on Sirius XM Rush 93. When we come back, we'll start taking some calls. Get in the queue at 866-522-2846. And if you happen to remember any of the names that you think John Anik has partnered up with, uh, hit us up with some. We'll, we'll come up with a list right away. And and uh, I, I think between Goes, myself, and Dan, we should at least get 10. Maybe there'll be some tricky ones in there, but uh, that should be fun. All right. We will be right back after this break. Stay close.
They are the stretch marks on the underbelly of the MMA community. But hey, stretch marks are the new tats. They are gorgeous George and Goes. Start your day with SiriusXM. Enable the SiriusXM skill on your Amazon device. Then tell Alexa to set an alarm for your favorite channel, and you'll wake up to the sounds of SiriusXM. With SiriusXM and Alexa, you can get the latest news each morning without picking up your phone or turning on the TV. All right, we're going to jump on some calls right now. Did you guys come up with any names for uh, Anik? I mean, the easy one is Florian, right? Yeah. Does anybody want to go next? Uh, yeah, I couldn't. I, without, I didn't want to cheat, so I couldn't do any of the Bellator ones. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, I guess uh, <coughs> oh, you know, Hogan, obviously. Joe Hogan is an obvious one. Mm-hmm. Joe uh, Hogan. We'll, we'll just knock those off the list now, right? Let's get those out of the way. Yeah, I already put down Florian. Jimmy Smith, who we just did it with, mm-hmm. uh, Joe Rogan, Daniel Brian Stan, Daniel Cormier, yeah, Brian Stan, mm-hmm. uh, Cruz. Dominic Cruz, yeah, Paul Felder. I don't think he has the uh, Bonner wild card. I don't think he's one of those lucky holders. That was Cormier. before his time. He has worked with Felder. Because mm-hmm. uh, I know so. Brendan Fitzgerald did, but so did yeah. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, it's one right. now. Yeah. Guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't Misha Tate do one with him one time? Where it was three of them. I don't Hold that one off till the end, till okay. we get desperate then. Uh, who else? Who are we missing? UFC wise? Stanek. Mm-hmm. Brian Stanek and Anik, one of my favorite ones. What are we at? We're like six or something like yeah, that? Yeah, I thought we would fly through at least ten of them. We only got seven. So Florian, Smith, Rogan, Stan, Cruz. Cormier Felder. I'm going to text him right now and ask him if this includes, like, if he's going to go, oh, one time I went to Russia and did M1. And, I mean, we're never going to guess that one. Right. But it, I, th- I thought he meant just 16 in the UFC alone. No, that's impossible. It's got to include other stuff. But I thought it would just include Bellator. Bellator, he was there for one year. And I don't know if Smith was already there or not. So, uh,. I'll, I'll see if I can get some clarification, but there's there's seven of them. All right, let's take some calls. We'll start off with Gage in Fort Myers, Florida. What's up, Gage? What's going on, guys? How you doing today? Great. How about you? I'm doing awesome. Um, love to listen to you guys. I have one question for you. Uh, back to UFC 221, um, the G. Liang and Jake Matthews, they got their uh, fight of the night bonus? Yes. Okay. Uh, I've... I don't know how you guys feel about G. Liang getting still getting the fifty thousand dollar bonus and not having to give at least some of it back to Matthews because of the eye gouging. Mm-hmm. Because to me, I feel like he shouldn't even have been able to continue after that, let alone not have a point taken and then gain fifty thousand dollars for an illegal move that got him out of the submission. I wouldn't disagree with you. I think uh, I think a lot of weird things can happen during a fight, and I could see something like that happening when you're trying to push off or, or, or anything like that, but. His was just so blatant that I think we've all gotten past that could have just been a mistake. I, I, and, yeah. and, dude, the personal me, un, under the, under my breath, I don't blame you, man. If things were rough and that got you out of it, but you, you ended up getting through the fight, all right. But you're going to have to deal with criticism from people. And uh, definitely can't do it again, right? I mean, if you do it one time, people go, oh, that guy, huh? But that'll go away in a little bit. But, yeah, if somebody were to say, you know what, we thought what he did just didn't fall under our code of conduct. That's not how we act. We are not giving him a bonus. I wouldn't have a problem with it. Would you? No, I don't because that was pretty egregious. Mm-hmm. Um, and I hear what you're saying goes, but I think I'm more on the side of, um, you know, how you're not supposed to grab the other guy's trunks or the the water trick, you know, Romero in between fight or in between rounds. There's just a few things where I, I believe, yeah, I mean, that, that's why I, I kind of get a little outraged at some of the people that just think, oh, my God, it, it should be the most pure, holiest of games where there's no cheating going on. When in every single uh, play of, of professional football, there are so many fouls that are being done. It's just that the refs can't get to them all. Yeah. And so in MMA, you know, how are you not going to expect that to happen? Uh, it, it is part of not just sports. It's part of life. But – um. That one goes when you're messing with someone's eyesight like that. I mean, like that kind of damage. Ooh, that one's a, a little unforgivable for me. So, yeah, I, I would say um, for sure if they wanted to not make him a part of the performance bonus, I'm in for that. Um, and I, I 
you know how you said, "Hey, wink, wink." You know, you did what you had to do, dog. Not me. Oh, man. That, I, no, I, that'd, I don't be, like that'd be me under my breath in the back. Of course, mm-hmm. I'd say something. Like I that. guess if I was part of before. his team, yeah. But if I'm part of the UFC or anything, or I, I or a fan, I, I just didn't like that move one bit, yeah. man. L- l- let me add this angle of it though, because I let me just state, I, I think he should have been disqualified for it. If the commission wanted to take it a step further and not give him a bonus, I would have no issue for that, right? What Agree about, just what vision, about but an immediate cut? No, because no. no, because here, here's my point that I'm drawing is before the immediate cut, let's just talk about the bonus, what what's being talked about at hand. Does that start to get into a foul? Because like, essentially we talk about, okay, we need to protect the fighters from their fighters. We don't do that enough, which is true. But what about the basic job of protecting fighters from each other, which is the ref's job? You know what I'm saying? It yes. should, should, be, should be the ref's job. So, so at what point are we doing what's right and disqualifying him? Because I believe disqualifying him would have been what's right. But at what point are we now punishing Lee? And if we are punishing Lee by taking away bonuses or cutting him, does that mean we are thereby saying that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Lee did it on purpose? Because Lee is a guy, I actually kind of, I relate him to Husmar Pajares before this incident in the sense of he's a very kind of simple Chinese dude. And I'm putting that in a very kind way. I'm half Chinese myself. I've visited their countries and trained multiple times. Uh, I kind of know these type of dudes. And, uh, you know, then there's language barrier. You know, forget the third world country or the different culture, but there's just a good, complete language barrier. There's, there's a bunch of things there. And in the heat of the battle, um, you know, should he be able to feel that he has eyes? Yes, but he he was, he was rocked multiple times in that fight, concussed. I don't even know how. Me and my buddy Brian were looking at each other like, dude, how is he still fighting? Like, he's been dropped like four or five times. And, and now he's reaching over, with, uh, you know, for an eye gouge. And then you have Jake Matthews, who even after the heat of things could be upset, forgives him. Even post fights says, hey, man, things happen in, you know, things happen in the heat of battle. And just one more point to kind of elapse on this angle of it. If we're going to then cut money or, you know, presume that on Lee, then what about guys who I love too, Jason Knight, who, again, if we're, if we're talking about blatant fouls, if, that's, if that is the, you know, moral judging thing we're, we're judging on, what about biting someone's finger? That's more, that is more egregious just by as far as um, deliberate, being deliberate, that bite on the finger more egregious than the eye, if we're talking about being deliberate. And so, again, just angles I just wanted to interject on pack. I agree that he should have been disqualified. Paharis was cut, right? But he had multiple incidents. He had multiple incidents. Yeah. So perhaps yes, they yes. give him at least a, a, a warning. This is what we think. Um, a lot of fighters have been in that position yeah. and while concussed or while in a fight and not done that. Yeah. Um, so perhaps a stern talking to, but maybe not having him be a part of the bonuses. I I think that's what Gage's point was, and I, I think I agree. Yeah, or get the translator in there. You yeah. see really experienced refs will stop action, get a translator in there to make sure. I mean, they'll do that for a I fence I like grab. the ref just kind of like oh, yeah. swiping on like, you dodo bird, stop doing that. I think he made I, it worse I, too because the initial slaps almost like he pushed the finger I further th- into I thought, I thought he should have been uh, more on the spot there. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, at first I thought the original grabs on his hands were because he was going out. I thought he was checking to see if he was asleep. Yeah. But then I saw the eye poke, so. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the call, but buddy. Great to hear from you, all right? Thank you, guys. All right. You we'll have a nice day. You, you too. Marco from Waco, Texas. What's up, Marco? Marco from Waco, Rocky okay, Pasa, dude. What's Marco. up, bud? Hey, another guy that I don't work with was Dan Hardy when John Goodman wasn't available, so he got eight of the USA. Okay, I like it. I, I had him down. I have yeah. him and Eves Edwards down as possible ones. Edwards, but, but is he for sure is Hardy? fight as a color commentator? I don't know why, but I felt like one time he did. Mm. So that's why I have him on my maybe list. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Let's do a motion to change uh, Joel Romero's name from Children of God to the Cuban Muscle Crisis, man. Shout <laughs> out to Ben folks on the comment. Yeah. Is that what he called like him? Yeah, they called Ben came up with that? I, I don't know. I don't know if it was a listener who wrote it in, but I heard them mention it on their show. That's yeah, slick. yeah, That's the really Cuban good. Cuban Muscle Crisis. <laughs> perfect, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, <laughs> hey, when it comes to uh, freaking Rockhold, dude, uh, uh, well, I don't know what he... If he got a space on the freaking revolution now, but ever since he moved to ATT, or well, well, he left AKA because he hasn't been working there, this dude uh, hasn't looked good. And uh, another thing, like three knockouts in the USC, he's been pushed right by, by lefties, man. Belfort with a kick, then Bispin, and now Joel Romero. Every, every single time came from the left side, man. This dude got, had a problem defending the, le- the, the left side because uh, every single time. Knockout, uh, you know, with the, the left kick of Belfort, the left punch of Bispin, and now the 
the left picking over kind of Ro Romero, man. He needs to work on that shit. Otherwise, uh, the blueprint is there to knock him out, man. He's out. See you, Marco. Well, you know, he just won. I mean, I know his camp before that was with the Black Zillions, or what used to be the Black Zillions. Now it's the Combat Club over there with Henry Hooft. Mm -hmm. And so he beat Branch with Hooft. And, and and still the AK guys, and then he lost this fight. I don't remember the Bisping fight in L.A., who that was with, but... I believe that was with AK. He, I know he got knocked out under AK with, in the Belfer fight, so, you know, I don't know about this whole, um, you know, this camp's doing what. Um, I, I'm pretty sure he has a good idea of what's working for him, and I, he's been very clear on our show that AK, the, his main training partners have either had injuries or they have just not been available, you yeah. know, and, and he needs bodies, and he felt comfortable over there, and that's why he stayed. Um, but, yeah. Let's go to Showtime in Tennessee. What's up, Showtime? It's your time. Yeah. Hey, what's going on, fellas? Not much, man. How about you? I'm oh, doing great. Glad to have you back, man, son. Uh, thanks, Showtime. Appreciate that, man. Good to hear you, even, uh, even with the speed bumps you're hitting. Yeah, what are you on a baby helicopter? <laughs> no, I, I mean y'all sound crazy. I'm actually at home in my house. I'm not even at home. Hey, showtime! It, it's a little irritating though. Um, hang it. Hey, let's hang up the phone and call right back, and then we'll put you right back on because there's this little flutter, right, guys? Yeah. It wasn't just me. Oh, now it's gone. Now it's gone. That's because right. I have him down. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm down. Yeah. All right, let's yeah. let's just do that, and that way we can talk to him for three minutes or so. Uh, call right back, Showtime. And let's take a quick break, Danny. Let's get this out of the way. You're listening to MMA Junkie Radio on Sirius XM, Rush 93. You know what it sounded like to me was in the movie Predator, the oh, yes. whatever that thing is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he kept making some little fluttering yeah, sounds, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be right back. And if you want to follow Showtime, 866-522-2846 is the number. They say your life will be a lot better. Here are gorgeous and goes. 
It's the Impossible Springsteen ticket, and we're giving them away to Series 6 M subscribers. Series 6 M's East Street Radio uh, is filling all the seats for March 14th performance uh, at Springsteen on Broadway. Grand prize winners will get air, hotel, and tickets to this exclusive show. For official rules and to enter, go to Series6M.com slash Springsteen. No additional purchase is necessary. All right, so either the Predator 8 uh, Showtime, or maybe he took offense to the fact that we are bagging on his home line. He said it was his home line too, right? Yeah. Danny should just call him back. It was just sound. Yeah. It was just a weird sound. Showtime was like... It was definitely his cell phone. Yeah. That's how I recognized the number for sure, but uh, he said he was in his house. Hmm. Well, call back, Showtime. But you got to do it quick because we are going to be talking to CB Dalloway in about 12 minutes. Uh, he's got a fight coming up versus Hector Lombard. And, of course, you can call in after the CB Dalloway interview as well. Um, did you see Blades as a free agent goes? No, I didn't. Yeah, so now he's he wants some dough, oh. and he says he's willing to talk to Bellator. Do you think it's a good move for a fighter to be that open? Yes. Yeah? I do. For that little threat? Hey, yeah, I might go to Bellator. You Why know? not? Dude, he, he should have posted the Jerry Maguire, with Maguire gif to go with it. Show me the money. Mm -hmm. Why not? And it's a, it's a gamble, right, at that point? Kind of like... Uh, I mean, I guess a guy like Derek Lewis, they probably ran through something like that where they just weren't too sure what they had just yet, but it was time to make up their mind. And what if he were to say, by the way, that was my last fight. I am a free agent, and I do want to see what else is out there without directly saying Bellator or issuing it in any way. Uh, I don't I don't see it being too much different. You like the more direct approach? Yeah. Yeah, I like it. I could see, I could see, I could see Scott and Saki Kabara maybe, you know, getting in a getting in a bidding war if if if, if uh, Blades wanted to go test it, you know, obviously Bellator and I'm gonna pretend you're Curtis okay. Blades and right. you're Curtis all Blades, right. all okay. right, all right, and I'm uh, I'm all the promoters, all right. So right now I'm Dana White and I go, man, that was a great fight over Hunt. We're looking at um, we're looking to give you 100 and 100 going okay. forward, you know, and then we'll go four fights and the next one will be if you win. Um, 120 and 120, 140, 140, 160, 160. That's your four fight contract. Then Saki Kabara calls for Ryzen and he says, We're looking to give you 150, no win bonus. Uh, one fight at a time. And lastly, Scott Coker. He's willing to give you, um, we'll say, 150 to show. And a twenty-five dollar win bonus if you win. So I'll recap, and we're just gonna worry about the first fight. If you stay with the UFC, it's one hundred to show, and one hundred to win for four fights. Yeah, but for, don't worry about the other fights just yet. Um, but the first fight alone. For Ryzen, you get one fifty up front and twenty-five if you win for a total package of one seventy-five. So it's a less package than the UFC for that first fight. But it's more money guaranteed, which seems to be a sticking point with a lot of fighters. And then the other guy, or that was Ryzen, or sorry, that was Bellator. And Ryzen just said, 150 to show. Don't worry about the win bonus. Uh, and we'll take it fight by fight. So the nice thing about them is the next time, should you win, you can come in and, you know, you can start the renegotiation process again. Kind of like it's, it's done in boxing. You're not locked into a contract. Mm -hmm. Which one sounds appealing to this Curtis Blades? The UFC. Because I'm 26 years old. And I'm never going to be 26 year years old again. So I want as many fights as I can to rack up that money. And it seems awfully nice to me right now that the top heavyweights are picking each other off. Mm -hmm. And they're making them older and more damaged. I'm um, maybe a few fights from getting there. What if Bellator had said 200 grand up front, no win bonus? Bellator. But but there's got to be something in that contract that says I'm not going to be sitting on, on the shelf. Yeah. I'm fighting. This Curtis Blades? This Curtis Blades would uh, tempt the tempt the free agency because I would want to stay with the UFC for the reasons Ghost said but if they didn't meet me on that end and like you said those are the offers from Saki Gabara and Scott Coker unless Curtis Blades has a proclivity for Japanese women like Rampage Jackson then I would say he would go with Bell I, this Curtis Blades would go with Bellator because Bellator is going to pay you you're still going to get a decent level of competition where you won't be like you know not saying he would get match made with cans, but let's be honest. With the Risen contract, there'd be probably more stuff off paper incentives than there would be on paper incentives with that one, if you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. But Bellator, since he's young, be the reason why I'm saying Bellator, because they're gonna pay. They're gonna pay you for your time. We know that. They're smart. They know how young this guy is, and because he's young, 
he still has enough time to go on a run. Pass or fail, he can get a title in Bellator, or if, if you don't fail miserably and still have time to recoup himself as a heavyweight and get back to the UFC. So uh, only because of his age, I would strongly c consider Bellator if UFC isn't going to pay him what, he's, what I believe he's clearly worth. For me, if I was Curtis Blades and got those offers... I would take 100 and 100 over, I mean, 200 is tempting, but there's just something about being in the UFC for me. Yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, 100%. I believe you can maybe make it in other uh, opportunities if you have great people on your team. Mm -hmm. um, but I, if I was, an, if I was a 36-year-old Curtis Blades, I may take the money up front. And feel like by now I would have figured out if I can take out Stipe and Nganu and all these guys on the road to the title. I yeah. think I think a lot of veterans go, fuck, I can't take out these young guys or the champion. Mm -hmm. Give me the money up front. I'll just act like a tough guy, like I could take out anyone, but I can't. But uh, I got to get this paper right now. I think the younger guys still feel like they can be a world champion. I think those guys um, more than likely will take a little bit less to stay with the UFC just because being in the UFC is like being in the NFL. You know, and the Bellator guys, they do get paid well. I've seen them, you know, cash some big checks. But um, another thing that's been happening lately, I've noticed, is they don't fight as frequently, some of them. And I just think that you need that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. I know Chandler complains about it all the time. That's a good point. Let's see what Muna's all about. What's up, Muna? How you doing from San Francisco? Hey, how's it going, gentlemen? Hi, What's up, man? Muna. Hey, uh, George, I uh, want to thank you for checking in on me, man. And uh, go, sir, for not calling you back. I'll get back to you later. And, Dan, welcome back into the studio, man. I'm glad the surgery went well. Oh, thank you, man. Hope you're doing all right, too. Thank you. Doing okay. Um, so uh, the reason why I called is because of this topic of Curtis Blades. I'm trying to figure out if I need to stun gun Steven Morocco and the MMA Junkie editorial staff or George... Garcia for not uh, reading Stephen Morocco's uh, story about Curtis Blades and how many uh, fights he has on his contract. Probably me. Uh oh. Well, no. Here's the thing, though, and I'll be real quick, though. Uh, in the, yeah, because I because I read the article of Stephen Morocco. I read all the MMA Junkie articles because they do great work. But uh, the title it kind of implies that his contract is over. But when you read the article, which apparently George didn't do, uh, it says, "quote unquote." <laughs> Blades told MMA Junkie his high-profile fight was one of two remaining bouts with the UFC. So, um, yeah, so that's all. But it's a misleading uh, title. But, you know, George obviously didn't read We're talking about so. the one that says, yeah, on yeah. last fight of contract, Curtis Blades wants decent yeah. offer. Okay, so he's got one more coming up. That wasn't the last one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't blame you. It's a little bit deceiving title, though. But, uh, yeah. yeah, so that's all. But you guys do a great job. And then uh, I also tweeted uh, John Anik because I have no idea who the 16 people he's worked with. But hopefully he tweets back and because uh, I really am curious what the full list is. So. Yeah, yeah. So I, I've been texting him, and he confirms these. But he didn't give any hints towards the other eight. But did he say they're all? But he wrote 12 different teams with the UFC, and then he wrote probably nine to ten guys. So I don't know what that means. Combinations probably, 12 different teams. And so, he, different so he could have done, counting, uh, he could have done him, Rogan, in D.C., yeah. him and Rogan, and yeah. him in D.C. is three okay. different teams. I got you. Okay. All right. All right. Oh, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. All right, you guys. Hey, have a good one, there. and uh, hopefully Showtime calls. Uh, and he gets off his helicopter. <coughs> so have a good one, you guys. See you, buddy. Hey, easy. All right, later. All right, yeah. Showtime, uh, Colin, uh, but but not now because we're going to talk to CB Dalloway when we come back. Still got an hour to go on the MMA Junkie Radio Show, and so yeah, I believe that um, I do remember a. So I'm going to write down Anik with uh, DC. So that's Cormier and Brogan. I know I've seen that one. And then we'll have to figure out what other three team, three teams you know that the, the UFC has had with Anik there at the helm. But that that'll make it a little bit easier. I think we've basically nailed down all the all the um, all the guys. Oh, so uh, that's what he's saying. Probably nine to ten guys, which we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's either one or two more, and then the three guy combos. Okay. Awesome. All right. Sorry, folks. So, uh, one more hour to go. It's the MMA Junkie Radio Show on Series 6 March 93. Stay close. We'll be right back with UFC Middleweight, CB Dalloway.
Mango Mango. like saying what's a party without bubbles yeah. diane say hello to my nieces if you all haven't seen the movie back to school with rodney dangerfield which probably came out like 30 years ago i get it it's an old movie you still got to find it netflix hulu whatever the fuck use it get it you'll laugh your ass off rodney dangerfield's a comedian that passed away about 20 years if i had to take a guess and he was kind of like the original what was me you know self self-deprecating type guy um and he, he just had a really funny shtick, and he had some really funny movies, and Back to School was one of them. And Oingo Boingo is actually playing in a play. He's a rich guy in this one. He goes back to school, and uh, Oingo Boingo is the band that he hired to play his, uh, his college party. Halloween party. Yeah. So, anyway, check it out, folks. All right, right now we're going to catch up with C.B. Dalloway, an old friend of the show. Or, uh, old friend of the site, I should say. I mean, we've had him on the show plenty of times, but what I'm getting at is he actually used to blog for our website, when he was uh, on the Ultimate Fighter, and that was years ago, and now of course he is uh, doing his thing in the Ultimate Fighting Championship for the last ten years, uh, fighting in the middleweight division, and uh, he is, uh, and also uh, light heavyweight. I think he had a stab at that, but now he'll be facing Hector Lombard on March third at UFC 222. He joins us now on MMA Junkie Radio. What's up, CB? How you doing? Hi. What's up, guys? <coughs> Just. Uh in between uh, workouts here, uh, thought I'd give you guys a call. Yeah, you, you remember the days of blogging for MMA Junkie? Oh, yeah. <laughs> what was that, like <laughs> 10 years ago? <laughs> We'd have to bug you every Tuesday. <laughs> hey, uh, did you recap it? Yeah, did you get that done? Yeah. <laughs> that over? Yeah, that's been forever ago, but it seems like yesterday. Yeah, uh, all grown up now, and... Uh, been a member of the Ultimate Fighting Championship for 10 years, making a career out of it. Did you think when you were wrestling that, that you could make a career out of mixed martial arts, or did you feel like it might be one, two, three fights and get out, just because the sport hadn't really taken off at that point yet? Um, you know, when I was wrestling, I never had any thoughts of actually fighting. Um, it didn't, it didn't uh, cross my mind until I was done and actually working an office job and just kind of watching it on tv and was like that looks a little more fun than what i'm doing so we'll give it a stab mm -hmm. what kind of pressure did they did that have having those accolades you know of being an all-american and 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 you know the um that season really pointed to, to you as a favorite um did, did you like i guess having that spotlight or did you feel like it was just a pressure you didn't need at the time <coughs> yeah, it was fine you know uh it is what it, you know, was what it was. Uh, I was kind of a little inexperienced going on there. You know, I'd only been fighting for about a year. Just, you know, got six fights real quick in a year and got the opportunity to go on there. And it's one of those things you're not going to turn it down. Mm -hmm. um, so I went on there and, you know, did the best I could do and, you know, got earned my, earned my way into the UFC. And then, uh, you know, here we are 10 years later. Yep. You'll be facing Hector Lombard at UFC 222. I mean, you've pretty much faced a lot of people out there. Uh, and so this is a, a fresh matchup. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Uh, Hector Lombard, he, tough guy, former champion over at Bellator, contender at welterweight and middleweight, but, but never grabbed gold uh, in the UFC. Uh, you know, um, size him up for us. What, what's your scouting report? I mean, it's really... <clears throat> pretty simple, you know, he's going to come out and throw a bomb. Um, if he runs out of gas before he knocks you out, it's going to look to be in your favor. But, uh, you know, it, it's going to be tough. First round, I'm expecting him to come out like a, you know, a crazy man, th like, he, like he does, you know, throwing bombs and, and looking to take me out. So it's going to be one of those deals you got to weather the storm in the opening round and do what you can do, you know, get through there and then, you know, take over the fight. Kind of reminds me almost of what we just saw with Hunt and uh, Mark Hunt and Curtis Blades. The wrestler got out there and he, uh, you know, he stood for for the first round, but he also paid for it. And I'm sure that's the part you don't want to have. But at the same time, 
once he was able to, like you said, make the fight yours, uh, whether it be wrestling or striking, uh, that was it. You know, he was able to nullify everything that the, the heavy hitter had. Is, is that pretty much a similar blueprint? Yeah, except I don't want to get hit with Hector's shots, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Obviously, uh, like you said, you know, I want to go out there and uh, do what I do, stay on the outside. You know, I'm not trying to get in there and fight him in the pocket. You know, that's, that's where Hector is going to have his best opportunity. Um, I'm sure he's going to move forward the whole time, so it's you know going to be my job to move around him, use good footwork, and, you know, use my tools and uh, not, not get drawn into a game that's going to benefit Hector. CB, how much energy is actually used when you are able to body lock somebody and slam them the way that that Blades did? I mean, it's ooh and all for the crowd. They really dig it at that point. And you could tell Hunt didn't, you know, didn't like going for a ride a couple times. But at the same time, is it worth the payoff of the energy you're going to use to launch somebody like that? Uh, you know, it just depends. Uh, sometimes if it's an easy, you know, if you're positioned right, and it can be an easy lift and, and toss them on their head. Yeah, it's definitely worth it. But if you have to sit there and struggle and, you know, just use brute strength to do it, it's definitely not worth it. But if you can, you know, step around them, get your hips under them and, and toss them, yeah, go for it. But, yeah, I, w I wouldn't uh, use up that energy just to show off to the crowd, essentially. Um, but very rare you're going to knock someone out with a lift like that. And like you said, it does it uses a lot of energy, so... Um, it's one of those things, you know, it just depends on your positioning. The one thing I heard a lot from listeners of our show and some of my buddies that are casual fans of the sport, they don't catch every fight, but they'll, they'll tune in for the main event, the co-main event, or the real special cards, is that sometimes uh, the wrestlers can, you know, slow the action down. But I heard from a lot of people this weekend that Blades made it fun. For one, it was probably a lot of these, you know, uh, you know Jack and Hunt up slamming them uh but it was his ground and pound um on your side have you over the years because you've been uh you know because you came from wrestling have you been tabbed as the guy that can slow things down and therefore you know and unless you're pe knocking people out your career is just never going to like have the, t the kind of traction that that some of the you know the flashy guys get from you know the strikers yeah the big names you know um obviously that's what people want to see people don't really want to watch a guy wrestle a guy. Um, you know, you see that in, like, college wrestling, you know. We don't have huge crowds. You know, there's not 20,000 people showing up to watch someone wrestle somebody generally, you know, unless it's the NCAA finals or something. Um, it's not the most exciting thing in the world to, to see a guy wrestle another guy. People want to see finishes, you know, guys get knocked out or submitted. Um, even submissions, you know, people, people like them, but... I think the fan favorite is, you know, the guy that can knock everyone out. That's what people want to see. Or, or a guy that just goes out and, and gets after it, you know, puts on a show, standing on the feet, trading shots, which isn't always great for the longevity of your career and your health. Um, so it's a catch-22. Yeah, you're right. Um, you fought at light heavyweight in your last fight. Why the return to middleweight? Uh <clears throat> When I originally went to uh, light heavyweight, you know, I was, I was a little bigger um, and, you know, suffered that injury in Cleveland and jacked my back up and lost some weight, you know, lost some mass, and it's going to be a lot easier for me to make middleweight. Um, originally, why I went to light heavyweight, I was, I was struggling a bit to make middleweight. Um, so, I, and like, it was about a 10-pound difference, you know, I lost about 10 pounds of muscle through the injury, you know, not being able to work out as much and just feel that I can make light, or I can make heavyweight, ah, middleweight yeah. a lot easier now. So I'm going to give it another go. And for those that are listening and may not have heard, uh, CB was in an elevator with a bunch of other fighters that fell. How many How many floors, CB? Was it three or five or something like that? Three so yeah, three floors, 30 feet. Yeah. The and I... I know a lot of people think that it's, that's not <laughs> it's not a big deal, but it is a fucking big deal, uh, especially when you talk to you know like firefighters who have said there's been serious injuries from a drop like that. And um, I, I imagine by now, uh, have there been any lingering effects of what happened then, CB, or did you heal from that completely? Yeah, it's you know as good as it's gonna get. You know, I'm still able to do what I do, and you know I'm just happy for that. Uh, 
So I was just still kind of hoping to get better, but, you know, we are where we're at. And, um, like I said, I'm still able to compete and, you know, just go out and do my best. All the videos that came from that, everybody that got out was kind of like giggling. I think they were relieved. Uh, and from the like the video or two that I may have caught you, you also kind of had a smile. Same thing, relieved. But at the time, did you know you were that injured? Like, wait a minute, I'm fucked up here, you know? Like, or or was that later on that you felt that? Uh, right at first, yeah, I was just kind of happy and relieved. Like you said, you know, um, didn't I kind of noticed something right when we hit? Um, didn't think anything of it. And kind of when I got out and started walking around, once everything kind of settled down um this kind of reminded me of like a car accident like it just happened kind of like in a daze like the rest of the day after it happened wow uh and then yeah like once i was out of the elevator and was right there i was talking to the ufc doctor and stuff i was starting to feel it tighten up and it just kept progressively getting worse you know uh and just was in you know my best decision not to fight that night that's crazy that's talking life. to yeah I talked to Dana, yeah. I kind of talked to Dana at dinner. He's like, you know, we're not playing baseball. You're not going to get struck out. Like if you go in there and fight, and you're not feeling how you should. You know, you're going to get hurt. It's you know the reality of our sport. So I had to look out for my own safety. Well, yeah, okay. That, that that's cool to hear that he was uh, receptive to you know you not fighting. Um, CB Dalloway, our guest here on MMA Junkie Radio, former state high school wrestling champion, junior college. Uh, a champion as well, All American uh, NC2A out of Arizona State, and of course he was on the reality show, and now been in the UFC for about ten years. Sixteen wins overall, six by KO, three by submission. He'll be fighting Hector Lombard on March third, UFC 222. All right, goes. What do you have for CB Dalloway? CB, a lot of fighters, and I guess just people in general, can be very superstitious. And, and after that incident, did it ever affect you? Just kind of getting into elevators uh, after that or even fight week or anything like that? <coughs> um, that's one of those things, every time you get in one, it crosses your mind, especially if there's any little shake or rattle in it. Um, but in my mind, you know, it's one of those things that will never happen again. It's like getting struck by lightning. Um, so I just try to put that in my mind, like it doesn't happen all the time and should never happen again. Uh yeah, every, every time I'm in an elevator, you know, I think about it, it crosses my mind, and, you know, it is a reality. And I actually met another guy um, when I was in L.A. last <clears throat> that was in an elevator that dropped, like, six six or seven stories. Whoa. Wow. Like, really hurting bad, like, crushed. And so it's just weird running into another person that, it, uh, you know, had something similar happen to him. Because, yeah, outside of that, I've never met anybody or... You know, you've heard about things like that happening, but to actually meet somebody, very rare. So, you know, uh, yeah. like I said, I, I doubt it will ever happen again in my lifetime and have my fingers crossed it doesn't, that's for sure. You know, CB, when the UFC started, the way they build the whole thing was kind of what would happen if you take a karate guy and put him up against a jiu-jitsu guy and a wrestler and all that. And right now we have a fight where we have a guy with a wrestling background and a guy who actually has a judo background as well. He's known for throwing bombs, but he'll use that judo from time to time when he needs to. How much of the fight ever plays out that way in your mind? Is there a lot of wrestling pride, and especially when you face somebody that comes from a different discipline like judo, uh, is there any type of pride that's involved in that? Uh, not really. We're both mixed martial artists now. Um, I was a wrestler. Now I'm a mixed martial artist. And the same with him. Uh, we're good at everything now, and you're not going to make it in the UFC anymore by just coming from one background, you know. Um, you have to be well-rounded in this game today. Um, obviously, you're going to have your strength, but, you know, I, I could see us getting into, you know, more of a stand-up fight um, with the judo and wrestling kind of nullifying each other and using our other skills, and that's how the fight will play out. So, you know, you just... You never know. Dan what Tom, you get into and goes down. <laughs> <laughs> Dan Tom, our fight analyst. What do you have for CB Dalloway? Hey CB, you know that UFC 203 fight uh, you were talking about the elevator incident. You you were set to face uh, Francis Marbahoz on that fight, and correct me if I'm wrong. Since then, he's been out there to train with uh, you and Bader. Is that is that correct? Yeah, 
that's definitely correct. Um, his coach is actually our um, new head coach. Not really new anymore. He's been with us for about two years. Um, brought him from Brazil, Jai. And, um, yeah, you know, it's, the fight The fight world is a small world. So, yeah, you might be fighting a guy one week and training with him the next. It, it's very common. Another guy, uh, Daniel Serafian, um, I fought him back in 2013. He's been training with us for about five years now. Um, after that fight, he ended up coming to the U.S. and joining our team and training with us. So, it's not that uncommon for things like that to happen. That that's awesome to hear, man. It almost sounds like a, a you know, almost like a, a Brazilian injection going going on down there of just like new talent and new guys to work with. I, I got to imagine that's helpful for these type of camps, right? That's good, you know, having you know different partners in there. Everybody has their own little niche and things that they're good at, and you know, just helps you build your game and helps your team build. <clears throat> we have we also Hennon Barral was with us for a little bit. Samar Flamingo was with us for a little bit, so um, just always having different guys come through is huge. You know, you get different looks and pick up little pieces here and there of things that work for you, and you know, grow your own game. Now, with that in mind, do you uh, do you do you have to bring in any type of special coaches or training partners along the judo lines, or is is, is this something more of you know you use use what's around you and, and your experience to put together your game plan going forward? Um. I actually fought a guy who was on the, he was an Olympic alternate for the U.S. judo team in like my third fight, and my wrestling did very well against him, and I feel like, you know, wrestlers match up pretty well against judo guys, so I didn't really have to bring in anyone special, outside of the fact that, um, the dimensions of the guy I'm fighting, you know, he's very short for middleweight, um, built very different than most of the guys around me, so, uh. I've actually been flying uh, Daniel Serafian. He's in L.A. now. I've been flying him back on the weekends to do my sparring with him. He, uh, he trained with Hector, knows what, kind of Hector's game a little bit, and you know, was able to point some things out for me, some do's and don'ts. And, you know, he make, makes a good Hector Lombard. He, he moves forward, throws bombs, uh, fights out of the southpaw position pretty well. So he's about the best sparring partner I could get. CB, we really appreciate the time. Just a couple more questions. Um, just more on the personal side. You've probably lived now half your life in Arizona. Have you adopted, uh, you being kind of like a sports guy, the Arizona team, Suns, Cardinals, Diamondbacks, or you still fly the Ohio colors? I never really got on board with Ohio. I was originally from Michigan. My mm -hmm. dad worked for GM, and we had to move to Ohio when I was 12. They hated me. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> from Michigan, that's a huge rivalry. So, kind of always been a Michigan fan, but since coming to Arizona and Arizona State, you know, after graduating from Arizona State, yeah. Sun Devil for life. So, kind of my team. I never really got too much into pro sports um, outside of, you know, fighting what I like to watch and like to do. So, that, that's what I'm usually watching on Saturday nights. But, uh, yeah, I always support the Arizona teams and, and obviously Arizona State and everything they do. We're in Vegas, so we have a simil similar climate to you. But what I wanted to ask you was, um, have you ever seen the scorpions out there in um, and, and any snakes? Have you ever had any run-ins with snakes or scorpions out in Arizona? Yeah, I have an issue with them at my house. Like We had to hire a special uh, company to come and spray for them all the time. We're getting uh, a lot of scorpions in, in the house. I have a... Four-year-old daughter, oh. you know, it's kind of scary. She didn't get um, stung, did she? Yeah. No, we're able to you know, show her this is what a scorpion is. Stay away from it. If you see one, come get us. They're different from other bugs. Never had any trouble with snakes, but uh, yeah, scorpions. The bark scorpions are the black ones. Yeah, you guys got nasty ones. <laughs> so yeah, we got to watch out for those. What happens yeah. when you see one? Like, what's the protocol? Can you step Stuck on it? Fucking step on it, yeah. Or drop a bowling ball on it or run your car over it. That's what I'm doing. But I'll tell you something. Here in Nevada, <laughs> we have yeah. we have the junior varsity <laughs> scorpions. In Arizona, they got the varsity scorpions. They, yeah. Like he just mentioned, he, they're, they're a little bit more venomous. You, you ever been stung by one, CB? Mm-mm. Oh, okay. Close. <laughs> one time I picked up a pair of shorts. I'm going to put them on and shook them out, you know, before I put them on and shake their legs out. 
big ass scorpion falls out on the floor. Oh, runs under my dad. Was like, the first, that was the first uh, scorpion I saw in Arizona. I was like, holy shit. So Can you imagine getting that stung in the uh, nutsack or something like that? What happened that? to Amir? Amir Sadala. The same thing. You got yeah. stung in the nat- nutsack? Not in the nutsack, but right right on his upper thigh. Oh. And same thing. He was pulling out his shorts and they were in there. Holy shit. Now I'm going to start shaking out every shorts. Oh. I got the same. We got the same thing as you, CB. We, somebody comes in every couple months and sprays, and I've never seen one, but I know they're around us. Uh, some, we had our house sealed. You know, we were having a real big issue. We were seeing a couple of them every day for a little bit. Um, I don't know what was going on, but uh, we've got it under control now. But yeah, for a little bit, it's scary. Holy shit. Never got stung, but yeah, huh. creeped me out. All right. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to ask you, I, I kind of had fun reading, um, you know, just some of the posts that you had when you were blogging for us. And I'm going to throw out some names out there. And I just want to see how much your career has changed. So uh, I think this was maybe in reference to one of the last fights you had. When you were subbing in for for Taylor, uh, your support group at the time was Jason Janae and Jay Glazer. I think Janae was your um, manager. Glazer was probably just a buddy, I guess. Um, and and I, I think he used to live in Arizona. So if I'm not mistaken, that's probably where the support came. Yeah. Your training partners were Jacob yeah, McClintock and, and you had the Lally brothers. Are you even in any contact with any of those guys now, or is, or is everything changed in your career? Yeah, actually, I go up to LA a lot and do stuff with Jay at his uh, gym, Unbreakable performance in hollywood mm-hmm. uh travel with him and train some of his higher end clients here and there the lally they uh actually come and bring guys over to spar with us from time to time oh, cool. um like we need a certain guy you know so we're uh and that's just trevor i don't i haven't saw todd in a long time and jacob actually moved to, he's in like north carolina somewhere has his own jiu-jitsu school um fights here and there but yeah, uh, Janae, don't changed. talk to him anymore. That <laughs> a lot's yeah, I don't changed. Know what he's up to. Yeah, and, and yeah. Uh, in 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 the same post, one thing you did to pass the time was to go play craps. You still uh, you plan on doing that in a few weeks when you're here in Vegas, just to pass the time, or are the gambling days over? Uh, no, I ain't got that kind of money anymore. <laughs> have, have a kid and mother. Stuff you know, just been through injuries and shit. So yeah, I keep my money. Can't be giving it away to the casinos anymore. Right on, brother. Well, hey, nice catching up with you. Thanks so much for the time. We really look forward to your fight versus Hector Lombard. Should be a great one. So we'll see you in a couple weeks when you're out here in Vegas. All right, sounds good, guys. You have a good one. Take care. All right, you too. See ya. All right, folks. That's CB Dalloway, who can be followed on Twitter at CB Dalloway. Let him know you heard him on the at MMA Junkie Radio Show. Been a while since we caught up with him, huh? Yes, yeah. I forgot he was a Doberman. Yeah. Two scorpions, though. A day he was seeing. Dude, that's, that's nuts. Uh, but uh, how big are they, though? Because the ones we have are, like, tiny, tiny. But I think his are, like, at least this big, right? Why do you say the ones we have? Please tell me you've never seen one in our house. No. Mm. When I walk over the bridge, I've seen one there. Yes. Yeah, there was um, tiny. But, yeah, no, I've never seen anyone. Not even one in our neighborhood. But mm-hmm. when I've seen them, they've been out there, and they're, like really small well i asked the guy kayshawn's his name the one that comes in sprays Mm -hmm. and i go so where are they mostly and he goes they're all over the place you're not helping me i go southern highlands mountain's edge summerland henderson and he goes man they're everywhere he goes i don't see as many at southern highlands he goes but mountain's edge they're everywhere and i'm like really because what i was thinking was okay we appear to be safe in the house i'm thinking more for max or jrt uh a human my size can get stung and it'll suck i'll probably sit on the couch for two days it hurts but you want, I heard if it really, really hurts, you go to the ER. Otherwise, it just goes away. I've heard that from a couple of buddies that got stung. So I'd probably just sit on the couch and, I guess, sit with, sit with the pain. But uh, Max, you know, he's 18 pounds. I don't know what would happen. But it did make me think, well, if they're all over Mountain's Edge, but we don't got it in the house, that means every time Max gets walked, I just have to make sure. Because, you know, mm-hmm. at some point when Max gets out, he likes to walk. I mean, he's excited. He's burning energy. So he's walking. Towards the end, when we reach the half point, the halfway point, we start coming back, and he starts winding down. He becomes more of a sniffer. Yeah, and he'll jump yeah. around and, you know, just sniff uh, whatever's out there, you know, trees or the grass. And I guess maybe that's where I just need to be uh, a little bit more careful. I'm usually just pulling them away from people that don't clean up after their dogs. But uh, I, I kind of got out of the idea that 
there might be scorpions, but I'm glad Keishon told me that because I'm going to have my head more on a swivel. Dude, but two per day? Shaking one no out of joke. your shorts? Can you imagine? Oof. Man, I guess if I got stung in my ass, <coughs> you know, that, that's uh, in your shorts. That's probably the one place, right? Or I guess depending what kind of shorts you had, your thighs. Dude, especially but if the yeah, front? Oh, oh yeah. my God. The front? Fuck that. Especially if you got to treat it the same way as a Portuguese man of one have somebody pee on you. I think it's real awkward. Oh, definitely. Forgot about that story. Yeah. All right. So let's take a break. Uh, you're listening to MMA Junkie Radio on Sirius XM Russian 83. When we come back, we'll take some calls. 866-522-2846 is the number to call in. We'll keep talking about these fights that have occurred, the ones that are on the horizon. Because this weekend's big. You got Bellator on Friday and the UFC on Sunday. In addition to all the other shows that are out there as well, man. It just gets more popular and more popular. MMA busting up, uh, blowing up worldwide, I should say. We'll be right back.
They are the stretch marks on the underbelly of the MMA community. But hey, stretch marks are the new tax. They are gorgeous George and Goes. It's the Impossible Springsteen ticket, and we're giving them away to SiriusXM subscribers. SiriusXM's E Street Radio is filling all the seats for the March 14th performance of Springsteen on Broadway. Grand prize winners will get airfare, hotel, and tickets to this exclusive show. And for official rules and to enter, go to SiriusXM.com slash Springsteen. No additional purchase is necessary. You know, I was talking about all the shows that come up every week because I have to start the rankings chatter on our website. So I have to check these uh, shows. Some of them I can skim through because I already know better. But just to give you an idea of how big MMA is getting. So this weekend alone, I mean, if let me just say this. Uh, on our website, MMA Junkie, we are MMA Junkie Radio, the official radio show of MMAJunkie.com. And so if you go to our site, the tabs at the top, one of them is called Rumors. If you hit the Rumors tab, you will have uh, at your disposal basically all of the cards that are coming up. And mostly, you know, they're, they're televised or, you know, you'll have great access to them. You know, maybe they stream them or whatever, but most of them are, are basically uh, televised promotions. So starting things off, I just hit the Rumors tab, and on February 16th, which is on Friday... Bellator has Nelson and Mitrione. That's Bellator 184. LFA comes back with uh, Willis versus Stewart. We're just talking about Willis. Yeah. <laughs> and then two days later, because Sunday is when the UFC is doing their card this week, not Saturday. Cerrone and Medeiros. The following week is one championship. And then Cage Warriors. So we've heard of all them. And then the UFC again with Stevens and Emmett. Uh, so we've heard of all these promotions, right? And But let me tell you about all the other stuff that goes down. That's just the next two weekends right there. On February 14th, tomorrow, there's AFC 137 in Anchorage, Alaska. On the 16th, same night as Bellator and LFA, there's ACB 80 in Russia. Hey, is this the Tumanoff that used to fight in the UFC? Yeah, yeah. Albert Tumanoff nice. is on that card versus Nashan Burrell. Oh, yeah. How about that? Uh, Leandro Silva's on that card. Alexander Sarvnovsky. They called him Tiger, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Yep. Over at Bellator. Okay, look at these guys. I think this is who Frank Mir um, announces for. Evgeny Irokin goes. Remember, we. Mm -hmm. Called this the fight heavyweight. Heavyweight. Uh, yeah. Uh, What's Russian his record now? He is seventeen and six. He was close to being ranked at one point. He was in the main event at World Series of Fighting Global when Goes and I traveled to Japan to call that fight. So that fight happened with Richard Odoms. Oh no, no, no! We didn't call that one. We called Brandon Cash. Mm -hmm. He won three more after that, beating veterans Richard Odoms, Emmanuel Newton, and Eric Prindle. Then he lost two in a row. He's coming off a loss right now. But getting back to uh, what I was talking about, um, there's SFL, which is a super fight league in India on the 16th. Titan FC, Shor Shorty Torres, headlining there. And that's Titan FC 48. Now that's on the UFC Fight Pass. That's on the 16th. Now we get to the 17th. MMA TC, which is Total Combat in England. Key... KOTC, which is King of the Cage in Niagara Falls. There's a boxing event that they threw in there. We'll skip that. WXC in Michigan. Uh, Era VIP promotion in Russia. CAF 11 in the United States. And this is in Studio City. Huh. Which is uh, near LA. SFL comes back again the following day with a fight card in India. Uh, then there's the Lux Fight League in Mexico. Now we're on the 18th, the same night as the UFC. So I've probably named off about a dozen shows in addition to the ones I named off earlier. Mm -hmm. GCF, which is Gladiator Challenge Fight in Brazil. SFL again in India? Holy shit. Back to back to back. M1 Challenge 88 in Russia. FNG, which is Fight Night Global in Russia. Let me pull up that card because they have yeah. a few fighters that uh, we've heard of in the past. I think that's where Al Capone wound up signing. Oh, Dominic Steele. That's right. We had him on the show. He'll be on that fight card. 
And I was wrong. I guess there's really no other recognizable name. They're all just Russian names that I've never heard of. Uh, so we're still on the 18th, and I've probably named off like 20. There's uh, Baikai FC in Russia. ACB comes back again in Dubai on the 23rd. Now we're at the 23rd. Super Fight League in India. Cage Warriors. I said that earlier. Budo 27 in England. GMC in Germany. Deep in Japan. Wow. <laughs> Ecuador has QFC. Shudo in it's Japan. Be Kito fighting championships or something, right? Yeah. Dead Serious MMA 27 <laughs> in New Jersey. Dead serious. They're already on the 27th episode or fight card. Imperium MMA in Brazil. RCC well, that's boxing. Um, WFCA in Russia. Slam 15 in Slovakia. Wow. The Netherlands come strong with Shaolin Ru. Superfly League won't go away. Uh, RCC in Russia. Russia, Russia, Russia. Wow. We got to have him. Right? We got to start uh, having our uh, MMA junkie used to be an Espanol at one time. Mm -hmm. Daniela Morgan, John's wife, used to. I, I don't think she would grab all of the stories we put out. And at the time, we weren't putting out as many. But she would grab at least four or six per day. That was her job to translate them. And uh, we need to do that in Russian. Yet. <laughs> wow, that's a lot of fight cards in Russia. Pay him. We just got to pay, pay somebody their money. <laughs> yes. Incredible. All right, let's take some, <laughs> phone, uh, some more phone calls here before we wrap up. Showtime's back. What's up, Showtime? Yet again, it's your time. Go. Oh. Hey, we're going on, fellas. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, yeah, we can. What's up, bud? All right, bud. Not much. I had a headset on in the earpiece on, man. For some reason, it was giving a bunch of static. Uh, man, the card this weekend, man, I, I really was watching it. I had a lot of stuff going on, so I couldn't sit there and watch it like I wanted to. But, man, the, the, I actually lost <laughs> on the co-main and the main, actually, because I bet it, you know, opposite ways. But that that's the blueprint. If you want to beat Hunt, man, you got to wear him down. If you look at all the fights where he got beat from Brock to whoever, they basically dominated him and kept him on his back. You can't strike off your back. And I guess I, I doubted Romero. I, I kind of, I mean, his last fight, I was out there and saw alive when I was in Vegas when he fought Whitaker. And you're right, his gas tank did get depleted, you know, that fight. So he actually showed me something, man. When that guy wanted to explode, I mean, it's basically unbelievable, man. I, I don't care they talking about that punch. If he would have hit anybody with those punches, he hit Rock Hole with. If he would hit light heavyweights with those punches, they would have went down just like Rock Hole went down. Well, that last one was devastating. You know, the other one, um, it just depends, man. The temple, the the behind the ear, your equilibrium's off, uh, getting clipped on the jaw. You know, I mean, I couldn't believe it when what was his name? Um, the guy knocked out Kimbo with a jab. Sage Seth. Punches, Seth. I couldn't believe it that with a jab he was able to wobble Kimbo, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and then I've seen other guys get hit super hard in the jaw. Check out Andre Arlovsky versus Tim Sylvian. Look at how hard Arlovsky hits him in the second fight, I think it was, in the jaw. And that was in Anaheim? It was, like, it was like this loud. baseball bat hitting someone's head is what it sounded like. And Tim ate it and then Easy came back him. and uh, knocked out Arlovsky. It just it depends, man. Depends on how hydrated you are, where that punch lands. Um, it depends on the but other but guy but too. Some guys are going forward, and that momentum yeah. along with the punch is way worse. There's no disputing that going Romero's backwards. got power. He's got some great finishes in the middleweight division. Yeah, man. That, I mean, it, you know what's amazing? Just, just look at him and look at Jacare. Both of these guys are great in different disciplines, and they're actually knocking, knocking guys out. So, I mean, that, that's pretty amazing, man. But I, I have to kind of just put um, Romero on that, but pretty much like with, with two wood, they probably two of the most explosive guys that when they want to close that distance, they can close it so fast and with so much force. I mean, I, I really don't see any other fighters, you know, with that, who's been able to close that distance so fast and, when they, when they bring it, they bring it. I mean, it's just, it's like, it's almost like he hits a bet, like a finishing bet on a video game. I mean, it's over. Yeah. I agree, my man. 
Uh, thank you very much for calling back. Great talking to you. Especially from the International Space Station. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, look at look at who your Romero's beaten. Clifford Starks and Ronnie Marks. Honey Marks, Brazilian. I'm not going to tell you that, oh, my God, they're highly ranked guys. But they're, they're yeah. tough outs. And when you're finished. moving over to the UFC, they're just tough outs. He did finish them both. Um, then he beat Derek Brunson, who we've all seen is a, a pretty tough guy, a tough middleweight. You got to give him that. You got to rack that up as a solid win. Brad Tavares, yep. another solid win. Tim Kennedy, another solid win. Leota Machida, former champion. Ronaldo Souza, um, top five for the like the last five years. Chris Weidman, former champion. Luke Rockhold, former champion. This close to beating Whitaker. If he had beaten Whitaker and became champ, and this was his first defense against Luke Rockhold, if you put his numbers next to Anderson's, they're very similar. It's just that Anderson came in, beat Lieben, then he destroys Rich. I should say he destroyed Lieben too. And right away became champion. So what he had was a lot of title defenses. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? This yeah. guy kind of had a long road to these interim title fights. But One of them didn't even become a fight. But still, when you stack up name versus name, he's had an impressive run. In Anderson's stretch, though, you're going to come across names like Looter, right? Guys that just didn't, at the time, Latis, Cote. Mm -hmm. This is Murderer's Row. Mm-hmm. And it's not now Anderson did test himself versus a former light heavyweight champ in uh, Griffin. Uh, he also fought Stephen Bonner, so you know he, he went up uh, a weight class to test himself, and uh, you know he had the battles with with Chael and other guys that that did, that did deserve their shots, but uh, just just something that stood out, mm -hmm. you know, in regards to. Uh, all-time great middleweights. I, I think Yoel has the ability. I mean, he's 40. That's the problem. But if he were to beat Whitaker, he'd be 1-1. You know they'd have a trilogy set up at some point. But, uh, I mean, who else is there going to be to throw his way? I don't know. Let's talk to Joe in H-Town. What's up, Joe? How you doing? Good morning, fellas. Hi, Joe. Hey, um... I don't know what y'all guys been talking about on the show, but uh, I wanted to talk about two things. Uh, number one, I saw a lot of people getting pissed off at um, Dana White saying that Yoel Romero is going to be next for the Whitaker, and, and you know, I'm like, why, why, why do people get pissed off or stuff like that these days? I mean, this is a different era. I mean, it's not like back in the day where hey, you had to win three or four or five wins in a row to get a title shot. I mean, 15 to 20 times, they've given title shots to people who have come off a loss. So I just don't understand, you know, who who really cares, like, who fights for the belt? I mean, they're, they're not interested anymore in finding out who the best in the world is, in my opinion. They're just trying to make the money and whatever. That's their company. They can do whatever they want. But it just kind of bothered my mind that so many people were getting upset that, yeah, he missed weight and he's still going to get a title shot. I mean, who really cares, and why do people get upset about stuff like that? Well, yeah, I saw the same thing. I saw people getting pissed at the fact that he missed weight and that he's had uh, a problem with USADA, which, by the way, was out of competition and got reduced to six months, which just goes to show how that really wasn't uh, as, as uh, glaring as the other guys that have accepted their two years and, and had to serve two years or are serving two years. Uh, he had one of the better defenses out of anyone out there. Um, then you have the incident with uh, Kennedy, you know, and the ice and the water. And, uh, you know, Kennedy made that uh, obviously a big deal. So I think a lot of people just from the beginning, uh, th there's been these little incidences that uh, he's rubbed people the wrong way. And let's not forget about for gay Jesus. You know what I mean? Um, I, I, that's the only thing I can think of. And then there's just some people that are like, hey, I'm just a Jock Ray fan, and I want to yeah. see him next. I thought I laid out yesterday why it, why it could be Jock Ray and why it could be Romero. Um, but, you know, they, uh, they they have similar cases, but I think Romero's might be slightly stronger. Um, now, a lot of people will just say, I don't want to see a replay of a fight I saw within the last year. That's what I think a lot of which, people Which is under. what Jock Ray would still be. It's just Romero's was closer to uh, present time. Yeah, I think a lot of people are just kind of over rematches. Yeah. Yeah. Joe. Okay. That's yep. great, great insight, Ghost. Great insight, Ghost. Hey, um, Thanks, man. I got uh, 
Yeah, you're welcome. I, uh, one other thing, I wanted to defend Tyron Woodley a little bit, man. He's been getting crap the last, you know, I don't know, ever since he had the belt. I mean, the guy who was in NWA, for crying out loud, man, he's a, he's a damn movie, a big-time movie, and yeah, he didn't play a big part, but, I mean, the guy is a potential superstar if you want to make a superstar, and it just seems like Dana just not interested in the Tyron Woodley business. I mean, the guy has beat whoever has come in front of him. He, you know, he fought his way up to a belt. He got the belt. He has defended it. You know, even though they wanted Thompson to win it, and hey, he beat him again. I mean, I don't care how he wins. I just want to see who's the best in the world, and he's been doing that. And yeah, he comes across, you know, kind of crying a little bit about how people don't want to, you know, see him how, how I see him. But I mean, he's done whatever it takes to be a, a fighter and a champion. And I just, I really can't get this the fans like all kind of boo hooing on him. And I just, you know. I might be crazy, man, but if I'm, I'm not going to say it. I was going to say some racial. I'm not going to say it. But How would you suggest they market that, him better? Well, I mean, they're not interested. They keep, you know, he keeps talking trash about Tyrell Woodley, and so many fans these days still believe every single word that Dana White says. And if Dana White says, you know, Tyrell is a piece of crap, then that's what the fans are going to think. And that's just so dumb to talk about your champions like that. Okay. Yeah, have you ever Thanks heard that uh, even bad publicity is good publicity? Mm -hmm. I think him coming at Tyron Woodley has actually helped Tyron Woodley's name Maybe get out. Maybe a little bit of a Stone Cold Vince McMahon thing going yeah. on. Well, I'll say this. Look, he's been featured on a card headlined by Conor McGregor in New York, and he was featured on the card headlined by um, uh, DC and Jones, which yeah. that was the biggest card of 2017. The other one was the biggest card of 2016. He's also been featured on Fox, and the UFC strongly influences who's on Fox. In fact, from what I heard, because of what happened with Hendricks, remember the fight that didn't happen, and they wanted to keep him relevant because they knew he was sticking out as the number one contender. They just couldn't get that fight to happen. Uh, they were they they actually made a strong case to have Tyron on uh, there, and since then, Tyron's knocked it out of the park. Yeah. Um, you know. Uh, TMZ and the UFC kind of had a, a, a relationship as well, and I don't know if Tyron got that on his own hustle or if maybe he was suggested there. But in my opinion, how, how um, I don't know what else they could do. Maybe give him a touch tough coaching gig, which Colby Covington told us his name was there uh, and he signed, and maybe the other party wasn't ready or what. But I, I what I want to know is how again can the UFC promote him? Um, if I'm not mistaken. John Anik traveled to St. Louis and did one of those, I don't know what they call it, I think Megan calls her the exchange. I'm not sure what Anik calls his, but basically, hey, this is where I grew up. This is where I went to high school. So they've sent a camera crew out there to to uh, Missouri. I don't understand what else they could do, man. They're putting them on the biggest cards. They're putting them on television. They're sending a crew down there. Maybe give them the tough gig, but what else? What am, what am I missing? Because tough is as big as it, as it can get. I think okay. because it's just you constantly there. It shows different sides of you. I, I think. And by the way, he's not just in L.A. He gets flown out to the ones where he's part of the panel with. Uh, yeah, yeah. What's his name? Kurt. Menifee. 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 Yeah. You know the what I mean. Fox ones, so yeah. he's not announcing like Cruz and D.C., but he's out there at least on location That's on Big Fox. Too. So uh, again, I, I just don't understand what else. They could do. They, I mean, does he want the company to be called the UFC featuring Tyron Woodley? I mean, what else is there? The tough gig, we covered that, but what else is there? Uh, I, I don't know that there's that many other things. I think maybe what he's getting at is just don't slam me and call me a bullshitter. But Probably. that's kind of what Dana's way is. Um, Rashad Evans, there's an article there where I, I was reading or seeing the headline where he was saying, Tyron, just bury it. You know, just it, it doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. Um well, that's what you we know, Tyron's kind of like I like to have the last word type of guy, you know, and and I think that that's as much as he thinks it may be helping him. Sometimes I think people just ain't feeling him, you know. But I, I will say this: I I believe he is promoted. Um, it, it's unfortunate that the UFC president did that, but he's done that to everybody. I don't think he's selecting color or or uh, hierarchy or anything like that. I mean, it has to do with the way he fights, right? That that's what really bugs Dana White. And yeah. I think if maybe he fought a different way, then yeah, maybe there would be a push. Tyron has said, "Look, I was injured in this fight. I was injured in that fight. I was injured. That's why I wasn't able to do these things." But you know, I Dana's not.
privy to that. You know, when the fight's over and someone goes, Dana, what'd you think? He doesn't say, well, let me get the medical report and see if somebody broke their foot in the first round or maybe they tore a labrum. Yeah. He just answers it the way they ask him. You know, that I can appreciate. And he'll just go, man, that fight wasn't the best. That wasn't the best fight I've ever seen by far. I've seen many better. You know, and he'll say whatever he is. Now, yeah, once we start to peel and unpack, we do find things out like a torn labrum. You know, and, and you can stand back and go, wait a minute. That is pretty impressive. He stuffed every one of Maya's takedowns. Uh, he beat a guy that had won seven or eight in a row. Um, you know, but but it, it, it's when you come across that information. Right. All right. So I, apparently these two are going to meet in Vegas and hash it out. But, yeah, I, I, I do believe that uh, I believe what Evan says. Just bury it. We got to get to this last commercial. When we come back, we'll take this call from Dan in Oregon and then get the hell on out.
and over and the rulers wheel. A fortune won and lost on every deal. All you